Memorial Museum historians were guided by a mandate set forth for the museum in 1979, which outlined the need for America's reflection on its role during the Holocaust. Through the research, one thing became abundantly clear. This history is an American story, and it was a local story in communities across the United States. In keeping with this objective, Americans in the Holocaust explores four main questions. What did Americans know? Did Americans help Jewish refugees? Why did America go to war? And how did Americans respond to the Holocaust? We hope that the exhibition and our lecture today provokes new questions and opportunities to reflect upon these guidelines, both in regard to the history and our roles and responsibilities today. Questions like, what is the relationship between knowledge and action? How do we balance humanitarian concerns with political realities? And what are the pressures and motivations that influence individual behavior? On behalf of myself and the staff at Prairie State College Library, we want to thank you for joining us in asking these tough questions about America's role in the history and our role as citizens of the world today. After this program, we hope you continue to engage with this history, visit the exhibition, and as always, read more books. We are proud to bring this exhibition to the community of Chicago Heights, and we look forward to the conversations it will spark. Please be sure to visit the exhibition at the College Library prior to the closing on April 27th, and we hope you will join us at our future programs as well. And there are calendars in the back if you would like to know when the other lectures are going to be. And I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome the eighth graders at Beecher Middle School who are joining us remotely for today's lecture. And I would like you to welcome today our lecturer, Bruce, to the, Bruce Mainzer to the podium. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I wanna thank uh, the staff at Prairie State and everybody associated with the uh, the Holocaust um, exhibit, the Americans and the Holocaust exhibit, especially Don Sterning and Valerie Moore. And of course, I have to thank, in a way, my wife, uh, Beth Shader, who is the uh, gallery director for the Christopher Art Gallery here at Prairie State, because she volunteered me for this. <laughs> so hopefully this, it was a good decision on her part to volunteer me. Um, I started this research in 2021 during the pandemic, and I published the first version of this story in January of 2022. This was when my mom, and she's on the left-hand side, um, was 102 years old. She passed away just this last October, just short of her 104th birthday. Um, and uh, th that's my Aunt Alice um, on the other side uh, of that gentleman in the middle who, from the title and the, uh, of, of my um, article, uh, is the hero that outwitted uh, the Gestapo. And that's them celebrating. Um, my research was first aided by my older sister, Sharon, who you'll hear in some of the tapes that I'm going to play, who in 1986 decided that it was time for the family to understand the story about my father and my mother. They both have separate stories. My father was a German Jew who, uh, as a teenager, lived in 1930s Germany and came to Chicago. And um, she wanted to find out all the aspects of his uh, escape from Germany. And my mother was um, a uh, Jewish person, obviously, who lived in uh, the Slovakia. Uh, she was a Hungarian speaker, and she escaped from uh, Prague in 1939, and they met here in Chicago. So uh, she, my, my sister basically took a tape recorder and on the back porch of our suburban home in Winnetka, Illinois, uh, conducted over three hours of interviews with them. Okay, uh, so 
the I I did publish uh, an essay in January of 22, and I got some things wrong about the story. And um, but I, I luckily for me, I was able to find relatives of the man in the middle, Harry Roth, uh, still living or they're my age, so I don't want to say still living um, in the U.S. and Israel. And they corrected um, portions of my st story. Uh, most notably, I was wrong about the location of this photograph. And they in, later in this session, I, I will show you how they uh, gave me information that showed the true location of this photograph. And um, so I have that published. I have the completed essay, which is absolutely correct now, uh, on Substack, and that's a long uh, URL to remember. But if you just remember my name, brucewmainzer.substack.com, I have about three or four other posts on that website. You'll be able to find the story, which is retracing the escape of my mother and aunt. Um, and then in addition, the tapes that I was talking about were actually donated to the US Holocaust Museum and they're available. All you have to do is Google my parents' name, Ibby and Martin Mainzer and the US Holocaust Memorial Museum or USHMM in, in any search engine and the tapes will come up. So if you have the time and you wanna to listen to three hours, of course my father was a much bigger talker than my mother. So my father took up the first two hours and my, my mother took the final, the final hour. Um, but one of the things about uh, this is that I've always seen this picture hanging in, in a hallway or in my mother's um, uh, books. And I knew, even though I listened to some parts of the tape, it was always very confusing as to what was really happening here. I know, I knew that there was something about forged papers. I didn't know where the forged papers were put in and um, which, which government authority allowed my mother to escape. So this research really started to answer a lot of the questions that n none of us really knew un until 80, really 80 years later. Um, so the story starts with, um, I was, pay we were paying for, my mother had Alzheimer's. She developed Alzheimer's in uh, 1994, about 1995. And she moved to a, um, a retirement home that was set up that my father was very involved with on the north side of uh, Chicago that uh, was set up initially for Jews who survived the Holocaust. And my mother probably is one of the last people there who is a survivor of that period uh, at that home. And I was paying for, we were paying for a safety deposit box. And I thought, you know, this is about time to just take the contents of the box out. And when we took the when we closed the safety deposit box, all these documents fell out. And I realized in looking at it, if you, you see a, a passport, you see a immigration card with the ship um, uh, that she came on, uh, a visa, I said, oh my gosh, this might be the way to put together how this story really came about. The other interesting thing about this, and you know, not only has, uh, in, I know we're on Google Meet, so I don't want to be too uh, promotional about Google, but uh, you know, with the tools we have in our home now, all of a sudden, we can do some pretty extensive uh, historical research. So, for example, you have an application for a passport. Uh, in the middle there with the big title starting with OSV. What's interesting about that is you can take, I used a Google um, camera translate 
and you could if you've ever used that to look at other languages it'll translate it immediately mm -hmm. and also as a sign of czechoslovakia which was a a multilingual country and still is although it, it's now been separated into separate countries of a Czechia, Czechia and, um, and, and Slovakia. Um, the part of it, the, the actual form titles are in Czech, but then it's filled out in Slovakian. So that's an in, interesting way that the, uh, you know, it gives you an interesting view of, of how, how this works. So, you know, because of my mom's Alzheimer's, um, and my aunt Alice, uh, passed away in 1994, you know, by 2021, I thought we had lost the total opportunity of figuring out how to, uh, of what the true story was. So, um, uh, so I, let me start the story from the beginning and it starts it, with, in her hometown, um, at the time she was living in, and pardon my, uh, Hungarian or French or, or Slovakian. It's Kyria Helmich is, was the name of the town. And it, as you can see there from the red dot, it was in the Western area of Slovakia. And it was a rural town. And my, my mother had basically uh, lived only a few years in lots of different towns in that area. And as you notice hun Hungary is right to the South. Well, like most parts of Europe and the Middle East, you really can't draw a border uh, over where people are speaking one language and another language. And so my mom actually was born um, in October of 1918, which was the year Czechoslovakia was created uh, following World War I. I believe it was on the date of armistice of World War I. And uh, it was uh, carved out of what was the former Hungarian areas, uh, the highlands of Hungary. And it was uh, Czechia, uh, or the Ch Ch at the time was called Czechoslovakia, United Czechoslovakia. And interestingly enough, my mother, um, only about... 30 or 40 years ago, once at dinner time, uh, my sister noticed that my mother's personality didn't match her horoscope. And uh, she, my, my mother then told everybody that, well, she really wasn't born on October 28th, 1918. She was really born on October 20th. So we said, well, why did you mention your birthday was on October 28th? And she said, well, my father decided to enter a contest for the, the first baby of the new state of Czechoslovakia. So he, he changed the birth certificate to October 28th and it didn't, she didn't get the prize. But what was very interesting as I went through these documents is that sometimes she would say, her birth, sometimes some of the documents said her birthday was on October 20th and other times it was October 28th. But then by the time she came to the U.S., she just decided her birthday was on October 28th. So as I mentioned before, my mother was a Hungarian speaker uh, and my father, my grandfather left um, Hungary in 1926 and came to the United States. So my mother um, never saw my father until she came to the U.S. in 1939, uh, uh, since she was eight years old. And she left uh, when she was just short of her 21st birthday. Um, so what, what caused the first um, awareness of trouble was the Munich Agreement of 1938. I believe it was in September of 1938. And for those of you who remember from history books, this is when Neville Chamberlain flew after giving away a part of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland, 
where there was many German speakers. And in order to prevent World War II from progressing even faster, you know, Hitler had already taken over Austria at this, at this point. He arrived back in, in London and said, we've achieved peace in our times. Well, that was not at all the case, obviously, uh, because you couldn't stop a man from Hitler or from proceeding to gobble up as many countries as he could. Um, but immediately after that agreement was signed, Czechoslovakia, this democracy that was created after World War I, started to fall apart. And the first thing done was the, you know, when, when the hung, Hungarians or, uh, noticed that Germany got part of Sudetenland, the Hungarians marched into the area of, of Czechoslovakia where my mother and her family was living. And uh, they immediately started putting in um, or laws restricting Jews from uh, running a business, uh, from, you know, conducting their lives, being able to have a bank account. Uh, so, you know, one of the things to recognize about Hitler and the Nazis, like other periods in history, it, all it takes is a little spark to unleash the same kinds of bigotry and prejudice across the globe. And so as a credit to my aunt, uh, Aunt Alice, she decided that this was not tenable. And I put in here a picture of Hungarian troops, not German troops, because these were the troops that originally came in and made life hell for my mother and her family. And she decided she needed to get to um, uh, Prague to find a way out of the country. So, um, so she left. And by the way, my mother was born in this town of, she calls it Kashau, because I think that's the Hungarian pronunciation of it. But I think the Slovakian uh, pronunciation is Kosija. So, you know, we really have to credit my Aunt Alice with her um, prescience of figuring out that something had to be done. So she, she went to Prague and to try to figure out a way to get out uh, in, I don't know the exact date, but it was a few months before uh, March of 1939. And then she insisted to her mother, um, to her mother, my grandmother, that my mom, my mom's name is Iboya or Ibi, uh, be sent to her in Prague. So my mom on the tape, and my mom didn't want to leave uh, her mother um, and she didn't see the need to do this, but uh, Alice was insistent. And so my, my mother can be heard on the tape saying it was the first time she'd ever been on a train. Uh, she was not yet 20 years old and she's very nervous and she made the trip uh, to Prague to join Alice. Um, so they were there for only about, um, I think my mother arrived in, in late February or early March. And on March 15th, uh, Hitler and, well, first his troops and then Hitler himself marched into Prague to take over, um, uh, uh, the state of Czechoslovakia. And um, so my mom on the tapes remembers, you can hear her talking about how, what she saw when the Germans marched in. And there was a just terrible panic all throughout uh, Prague as this was going on. So um, in fact, I, I uh, found uh, a citation from uh, the Jewish Telegraph Journal, which was, uh, I think, produced in London, and Americans were able to read it. And it basically uh, says up there, 
an undetermined number of suicides of Jews and anti-Nazis was reported from Prague as the Gestapo opened a drive to round up elements hostile to the new regime. A Gestapo officer arriving in Prague indicated that at least 10,000 arrests would be made before German occupation was completed. So what the Germans did was they not only uh, occupied and took over Czechs, uh, the Czech part of Czechoslovakia, but they also then, and they did this many times, they, they declared Slovakia, so they split Czechoslovakia again, and they declared Slovakia a separate state, and there was a fascist government that was installed there. So they, they did this also in France, where they occupied the northern part of France, where Paris is, and then the Vichy Fran French was a, a government set up that was a fascist government and allied with Germany. Because when you think about it, Germany wouldn't been able to have many soldiers to conduct war if they would have to occupy each country. Um, So, so the first thing, one of the first things I did was I checked out um, the the visas and uh, that that my mother was able to get, and um, there was a problem. And the, the, so, Jews would go to the U.S. embassy during this period and try to get out of the country, and my my, my mother and my aunt had a plan that they would need to get out of this occupied state now and come to join their, fa their father, my grandfather, in Chicago. So they spent day after day waiting at the U.S. Embassy trying to get out. Um, so what's interesting is that when Hitler and the Nazis marched into Prague, on March 15th, the State Department, I looked online, I, I looked and found that the State Department decided to close the U.S. Embassy um, on March 20th, five days later. Understandable. Uh, and then, then my mother, I found this visa in, in her area, in her um documents and as you can see the 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 dates march 28th 1939 so what happened here so i i contacted um i did some more googling you can see i i just google i i spent years just googling things and i found a professor who had written um a dissertation on how how jews in czechoslovakia and Morav moravia were able to escape, uh, um, were able to emigrate uh, before World War II. And she wrote a dissertation on this. Her name is Professor Laura Braid. She's from Albion College in Michigan. And she explained to me that, you know, there were many uh, State Department employees there who stayed behind and out of service to uh, the people there bravely just kept on processing um, visas. So this is eight days after the embassy was closed. Uh, so that was remarkable. Uh, and by the way, I, the reason I got to her is I kept on Googling Andrew Gilchrist, who was the vice uh, ambassador, but he had already left. And so his name, his stamp was used all the time, but her, that name came in in uh, the only reference to that name I found was in her in her dissertation. So my mother was able to get a visa because um, there was a, a visa, a, a limit of 25,000 Jews who could leave Czechoslovakia or who could emigrate to the U.S. The U.S. State Department imposed 25,000, not Jews, um, citizens of any type. On the other hand, my mother was not yet 21 years old. So she was a child, so she didn't have a quota limit. But my 
Aunt Alice did have a problem and that they had run out of that they had exceeded their the or being close to the visa level she had two problems one was that she was 26 years old so she her visa was restricted unless she could get past that limitation and the second problem was she wasn't really born in the state of Czechoslovakia she was born to the south of that region that I showed you in Hungary so where my mother got her visa on March 28th, they kept on lining up day after day, trying to get my, uh, my aunt her visa and um, they, without success. And then my mother tells the story and you're gonna hear her voice. By the way, you're gonna hear her voice when I play next. You're also gonna hear the voice of my sister, Sharon, and you can tell that the story is very confusing because she starts using the hero's name, even though the hero that I'm talking about is, isn't in the picture, isn't in the story yet. They, they, he hasn't come into the story yet. And you're also going to hear my father with, with his German accent. And my father will, the women in this audience know, will be many times uh, talking over my mother's voice. <laughs> and maybe changing the story a little, but I'll, I'll play it for you now. So you will learn from my father. He states that one day this young man, who asked me, asked me, is that Harry Robin? No, no, no. He said, now you show me how the man varies this place. And this is such a small class that it's around here, but it isn't written because it was so small. Mm -hmm. Finally, they gave up on us. <laughs> you played in the wrong place? <laughs> they gave up on us. Where did you play? It was just me and Whatever it was, he knew, but he closed his eyes. Mm -hmm. And finally, he gets to let us go. Oh. But then, that's all right. And we have to have a permit. So I, I don't know if you were able to hear all that, but she started saying, she started out saying she was crying all the time and she went into the office alone and the, uh, the American uh, State Department employee just said, just point at a map where your sister was born. And she just pointed at a place within the borders and he relented and gave up and at the end she said and now we had to go get a permit and oh by the way so here's the uh visa of my aunt alice so this happened on april 4th so we now we know this is exciting to me because the tape was made in 1986 and now i know that the visa was issued that day that she was talking about was april 4th 1939. So at the end of that tape, did you hear her say, now I needed to go get a permit? Okay. Now I'm not going to play what happens next in the, in the tape, but my father said, okay, you needed to get a permit from the U S embassy. And my, you could hear my mother say, no, no. And my mother said it wasn't the U S embassy, but she didn't know exactly where. And I would, play it over and over again because there's great confusion on the tape and the women would in the audience would know that the person doing the transcript even though she was a woman she took my father's view of what was next and so as if my mother had to get a permit from the u.s uh embassy that is not the case the next thing she needed to do was she needed to get a permit from the gestapo and the new location that was set up where her, her hometown was in Slovakia. And so this is where the professor, Professor Braid from Albion College really helped me understand what was going on here. The Nazis needed to get as many people who had fled into Prague to escape from the Slovakian situation back to their hometown. So they wanted people 
to they wanted to issue travel permits and the Slovakian government was new. Um, so uh, there, some place in Prague was set up to be the new embassy or consulate for this new Slovakian government. And that's where they had to go to get a, a visa. And so when they were waiting in line at this Slovakian uh, new consulate that was set up, and this is not a picture of the exact location, but it's just for uh, demonstration purposes. Um, there, they came across someone that they knew from their hometown uh, who was also trying to get out. And this man's name was Harry Roth. Harry Roth used to run the movie theater in their town um next door i think it was the town next door and the family was very close where the two families were very close to each other so they encountered him and my mother was ecstatic to find him there but they all had the same problem they couldn't um seem to get uh anywhere and there were no employees there so um the so, so there was a, Harry was a um, eventually moved to Connecticut. He first went to Israel and he was a, a remarkable guy. He was, only, he was only about five years older than my mother. He spoke Slovak, Hungarian, Czech, German, and several other languages fluently. So there, I looked at the, there was a newspaper that was published in 1956 in Norwalk, Connecticut, where Harry eventually um, ended up living. And it described the situation. Harry found hundreds of stranded countrymen milling about the Slovakian embassy in Prague. Realizing that it might be days before his permit might be approved, Harry went across the street to a stationery store where he purchased a book of tickets numbered one to 100. A short time later, a surprised Nazi officer opened the door to the embassy to find the crowd neatly lined up with Harry at the head of the line. Upon learning which ingenious man was responsible for creating order out of such chaos, he immediately assumed Harry to be an employee of the embassy and pressed him into service reviewing visas. For weeks, he blandly reported to the embassy each day, putting the Nazi stamp of approval on every visa he could get a hold of, systematically helping hundreds to escape the Nazi tentacles closing in around them. So because Harry knew mom and Alice, he grabbed them as the first people in line and brought them to the embassy and stamped their permits for tra now the travel was back to Slovakia, but I will now play my mother explaining what Harry told them. So then someone who comes to us, I got your permit. Now that permit, who knew that permit was to, for us to go back to Grahams. We, this is you try this to go out of the country. Wait a minute, he is not him. the permit, just like all the other permits, though, they go back <laughs> to that. After that, it's not in Germany. It's a stand for the Slovak. It's a stand for the Slovak. The Germans didn't know what they did. And eventually, the Germans had to sign it. They signed it. They signed it. They signed it. What he did it is, it's, it's in this letter. It's in this letter. He goes, he goes and gives this letter. Uh, a bunch of permits, he gives scientists. They didn't even know what they were signing. But, understand? but they were permits to go back to your hometown. That's right. That's right. So he says, This is all ready for you. Did for he you use that? Yes. He, he told you the truth that they were not valid? No, they were valid. They were to valid go, to go to your hometown. Home. Yes. But you don't use it to get out of this country. So. So then um, later, after I wrote the first version of the story, my 
cousin Judy, who is the daughter of Alice, who currently lives, who, who lives in Los Angeles, sent me an article she found in her mother's uh, memorabilia about another interview that Harry Roth had, this time with a Hungarian American newspaper when he lived, in, in the, um, or it was from 1965 when he lived in Connecticut. So I'll read you some passages from it. We lived in Kiria Helmich, Slovakia. Uh, the Munich Agreement gave back that part of the highlands to Hungary, and that is when our bank deposits were seized and it became impossible to make a living. We lost everything and I moved to Czechoslovakia with my younger brother. His younger brother was named Aaron. We chose Prague because that city was then free from German Nazis. In November 1939, I already realized we were trapped because it was only a question of time when the Nazis would attack the free part of Czechoslovakia. And I started organizing the under the radar immigration to the Holy Land. But on the 15th of March, 1939, the German Nazi hordes attacked Prague and I had to stop doing this. I resorted to a trick and started a resettlement movement to Slovakia. With the help of my brother, I asked our brothers and sisters to make an appearance before the Gestapo and tell them they want to move back to their former domicile to Slovakia. First, there were only a few people, but later more and more came to the consulate. There was big chaos and bustling, so I grabbed a paper and pad and started giving out numbers like I was a consular employer, a consular employee, although I had no authority to do that. And when once a consular officer passed by me, he believed that I was there on behalf of the Gestapo, and that's why I'm handing out numbers. On the other hand, the Gestapo thought I was a cons consular employee. That's how I ended up at the German consulate as a reliable person. And suddenly I saw that Gestapo's stamp permits were on a writing desk with the following text. The holder of this permit is authorized to cross the German border. Our main problem was that we did not know how to get out of Hitler's Czechoslovakia. And here the opportunity present itself, presented itself. Without any hesitation, I grabbed a bunch of permits and I knew I found the way to our freedom. I gave the first permit to the Herskovitz family. That was really remarkable to read this. And, uh, and after two dreadfully anxious weeks, I got a note from them. They managed to get to Paris without any problem. This was such joyful news that it gave my quest an incredible push. And in a short time, I issued permits to about 3,000 Hungarian Jews and persecuted anti-Nazi and Jewish friendly and Jew friendly Christians. And I also ended up using one to go to Palestine. So, so now let's talk a little bit about this photo. I was convinced that the joy on these people's faces, that they, uh, this would have to be after they got out of Czechoslovakia. And so the first version of the, this essay that I wrote, I've taken it down because I was wrong. <laughs> and um, in actuality, uh, after I put up the essay, as you, uh, as I said before, I was able to locate relatives of Harry Roth. And the relative that um, was most helpful was his niece, who now lives in Atlanta. And his niece, Arlene, Arlene Rothstein has a daughter named Rachel Rothstein, who is a professor who studies Jewish emigration from Poland. <laughs> and ironically, as soon as I started talk talking with Rachel, Rachel said, I know Dr. Braid, she and I are friends. So the interconnections are, were really incredible here. So, but they wanted to let me down gently that this was not Paris as I thought, this was Prague. But the way she, the way Rachel, the Professor Rothstein uh, handled it was she said, I'm gonna put up this Facebook post and I'm gonna ask all my colleagues in history from across the country, where do you think this picture's from? So you can see that also Rachel is, has, a, has an Atlanta way of talking because in the first, line she says i have a good story and mystery for y'all 
<laughs> so, uh, but she said, where do you think this photo was taken, Prague or Paris? And I can tell now after reading this that she knew it was figurable because she mentioned the street lamps. Uh, and so when I started researching again as to where the picture is, um, I don't know if you can see the street lamp directly above the head of Her Harry, but you can see it's got sort of like a curly Q and then down. And then here is uh, a postcard from 1906. So this is 33 years later, because that picture was taken in 1939, obviously sometime after April 5th or 6th or 7th. Uh, and this picture is from 1906, but you can see it's the same uh, street lamp. And so I became more and more convinced that they were right. It was Prague. And why would Harry end up in Paris anyway? He stayed behind to stamp more. Um, and then, by the way, the, the, the opera house is called the Hibernia Theater at the end of the street. So now we have a pretty good idea. But so what I did here, because I have to always do things with Google search. So this is the pic pictures from Google Maps. And I put on what the, the aerial view of the street right now. And I put a red star where I think they were standing when this picture was taken. And you can see the theater in the back. The two, the buildings there are, are new since World War II but they're on the same footprint and they're pretty much the same dimensions as, as the other. Oh, so, but I still had questions like what was the STE? What, what was that? You know, what was that? What, you know, I still wanted more verification. So I started Googling like crazy, you know, maybe there's a picture of, when the Germans came in, because this was a major street in, um, in, in Prague. It was the shopping street. Uh, and it's called Niprikope was the name of the street. Uh, it's like State Street or Michigan Avenue in, in Chicago. So I, I kept on Googling and Googling, trying to find an image. And all of a sudden, this image came up. So, um, now, this image is of German troops on March 15th, the day they took over Prague. And you here you see these tanks, and you can really see the strangeness because here's a streetcar competing in traffic with the tanks coming down the street. Uh, and my, my, my aunt and my sister and Harry Roth were probably standing right under this sign that says Bush which was a ladies garment store. The banners up above, using my trusty Google Translate on my phone, are all advertising in Czech, uh, ladies fashion. And, and um, now we know that the STE was PLAST, which stands for coats. I assume women's coats, because I don't think there's any men's fashion on there. So this was this this I only found about two months ago, and um, but it really nailed the picture for me. And to, and to think the joy in their face, you know, if this was March fifteenth, uh, they they probably took this picture a month later, and they're obviously celebrating the obtaining of visas. So the next issue or the next battle was the rail journey to get out of of um, Czechoslovakia because their plan remember was to head to head to La Havre which is where their ship would be leaving and to come to the US and join my grandfather in Chicago so the first thing I did when I saw all these stamps and these are stamps from their journey was let me see if I can get a a map of of Czechoslovakia in 19 uh, of Europe in 1939 a railroad map and I found this map 
So I was able to put on where they started. So they obviously started in Prague. And then the next station they came to was Primis in Pilsen. And you can see that stamp, it's kind of faded. You can see the Primis station. And I didn't, I couldn't figure out why would they come to this station because it wasn't on the border. And then I realized, oh, that's the border of Sudetenland with, and these were Czech people and did the Czech people not be, were they not able to read Slovakian? Because that's not the direct way to get out of, to go to Slovakia. So I'm thinking either they let them pass knowing that they were um, uh, uh, trying to escape or they just couldn't read Slovakian. The next station was truly where the German uh, police were. And there you can see Deutsche Grandpolizei means German border guards. Um, and that's where they were probably very scared because will this work? Because it didn't say they were allowed to, to leave uh, in that direction. They were supposed to go back to Slovakia. So here's what my mother was saying. And we were very scared. Every time we go stuck in the train, we passed it. We passed it. Once we were in France, we were already, you know, we, we, went, we went with the train and they were in the train. Yes. The job is controlled already. The airport station. Right, right. So when the job and Soldier who didn't understand Slovak or any other language saw the German, with the signature of the German officer, or most often of all the rest, just the next to the city, he assumed it was the German to go. Right? right. So he, he didn't said, know that it was a permanent So he was using it. His idea was to go ahead and use those permits right. for the yeah. 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 yeah, but if they would be. A little bit smarter, maybe read it, have a, have a translator, <laughs> they would have known that that was better yeah. not to go out of the Because they didn't know that the Nazis at that time, they didn't know that the Nazis that came to occupy them. For all they knew, they were deporting them. Deporting That's right. That's what it is. So, and the Perry Gold said, when we get out, please send us a telegram to say we are safe here and there, yeah. that he knew that this worked. Okay. So here it is. He was doing this for 3,000 Jews. He, 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 he left up with the same kind of thing. He he was the first one. So the, um, the last station, so they she went through Germany. Notice he went right past Nuremberg, where the famous uh, rallies are held. The last station they had in Germany was Kohl, uh, and that's that's a stamp on here, Bahnhof Kohl, Kel, and then they were finally in France in Strasbourg, and then they were on their way to Le Havre, but when they got to Paris, they were told that they had to stay in Paris because the French line, which they were supposed to go on, was uh, the ship that they were supposed to be on had a fire and they had to wait two days. So, you know, nobody had ever investigated this. And, you know, so I could see that she was now on, my mother didn't know the name of the ship that she was going on. So it's obviously was the Champlain, which was a French line ship. And you can see that um, from uh, the ship manifest that, Ibby and Alice are listed on that ship. But what was this about a fire? So I, typical me, I Googled ship fire, 1939, April 18th, which I know that they were on, you know, that's what, by the time they got to, and this video came up. By the way, this is how people got the news before their movies. This is the 
aerial caravan cruising in the sky off the coast of France, passed over the half to witness and record for you the most spectacular picture of 1939. In Dunn, ready to sail for New York at the World's Fair, the 34 pound sun giant of the French flag, the factory line of Paris. Fire was packing along her deck, smoke billowed out of its ship, and steadily the devouring monster grew. Watch how our cameraman plane circles about the burning vessel, and the film turning on the majestic scene. So they were supposed to be on the, the SS uh, Paris, which was one of the best ships of, of the time. And that ship, they, they were loading, uh, for the 1939 World's Fair, they were loading artwork, and all that artwork was lost. But um, they, which makes Beth very unhappy, I guess. And then... Um, the, the ship actually stayed in that state, was turned over in the harbor for over 10 years. It took 10 years. It was well after World War II before they could remove the ship. So, so they had to do something when they were in um, Paris. So mom told me that they saw this guy named Maurice Chevalier. Who, how many people remember Maurice Chevalier? Okay. So I had to Google that. So I found out that he was appearing in a play with his wife, Nita Ray, who's that picture in the lower right hand. And this is the actual program of that play that was obtained. And the Casino de Paris still exists there. So uh, that was a nice part of the story. Um, and then she had to uh, come back to the U.S. They... Um, they arrived into New York on April 28th. That's what the immigration card said. Um, and then they um, took a train. I don't know if it was the broad from New York. I don't know if it was the Broadway Limited or the 20th Century Limited, but I'm going to think it's the 20th Century Limited because it's a cooler poster. And then, <laughs> and then they arrived in Chicago, and that's now Alice. This this picture was taken in June, or this picture was developed in June of 1939. So it's very likely the first picture they took together with their father. With their father. And my mom had not seen my, my grandfather since she was eight years old. So they, they didn't recognize, you know, it's hard to recognize her. But, so, but Alice wasn't done. She still had to get people out of, of um, her fa other family out of, Europe. So she worked with the Hebrew Immigration Assistance Society. She got uh, my my young my youngest aunt Edith, my mom's youngest sister, and my grandmother went to live with uh, the oldest child who lived in Budapest at that time. And Alice and, and at the time in Budapest, people thought the Jews in Budapest were safe. Uh, because the Hungarian government, even though they were allied with the Germans, decided not to do anything to round up Jews and send them to the camps. So my, um, um, excuse me. So uh, my, uh, they got, working with the Hebrew Immigration Assistance Society, they got them tickets to leave out of Lisbon on a, uh, a ship called the Excambion. And I had to Google the Excambion. And on this very sailing, a story comes up that the ship, as it was six hours out of Lisbon on the way to the US, was circled by a Nazi bomber. So, you know, things kept on happening to my family. Unfortunately, um, my uh, oldest aunt, wh who would have been my oldest aunt, her name is Shari and her husband Erno and my um, what would have been my first cousin Judith um, uh, remained in Budapest despite Alice's pleas that you got to get out mm -hmm. and then as you many of you know after D-Day Hitler became worried about Hungary and Slovakia because partisans were making advances in overturning those governments so he took over both Hungary and um, Slovakia, and he sent many of uh, the, the Jews to uh, 
to be perished at, in Auschwitz. So uh, my, my aunt, uncle, and cousin were lost in Auschwitz. Also, my uh, my my mom's older brother um, William uh, was in a Slovakian camp, and he was deported uh, in November of 1944. And he arrived on, and I look, I was able to look up the train transport that he was on with his uncle, um, my great uncle. And they were, um, they arrived in Auschwitz the day after the crematoriums and the gas chambers stopped, stopped working because the Germans wanted to um, cover up their crimes. But so they were assigned to uh, a work detail and um, when uh, tragically when my um, when, when Auschwitz was liberated, my uh, William uh, went to, for his uncle to the infirmary where his where his uncle, my great uncle, had typhus and tried to carry him out of the camp when, uh, the, um, the, the camp was being liberated and my uncle, my great uncle said, you leave me here, you go and leave, just you go leave. And as he left, the Russians shot him dead. So, uh, and then ironically, my, my great uncle survived. Alice was able to get back to, um, uh, the, the area of Slovakia where, my great uncle lived and um, he told the story that um, this to Alice. So we know the exact date that my uncle uh, d died. So here's the family in Chicago, uh, the three sisters, Edith is on the left, uh, sitting down, Alice in the middle, and uh, my mom, that's my older sister, who shall remain nameless because she doesn't like to be referred to as an older sister. And then there's my first cousin. And then we still have Harry and I'll go to, I know I'm at the end of the time, but uh, Harry ended up organizing after two weeks of stamping everybody's visas. He ended up um, organizing a trip down the Danube, leaving from Selena and then um, going on uh, a Greek ship and spending over six weeks trying to get into Palestine with 600 other um, uh, Jews. And they were denied entry in, Be uh, in Beirut, Tripoli. Uh, they were even strafed by um, um, British warplanes and they killed the captain of the ship. So, um, what happened uh, was that the Haganah, the army in at the time in Israel, said, we're going to take all the, they did a, a transfer to another ship out just off the shore of Tel Aviv. And then, so it's about 1,200 uh, people were loaded onto one ship and they came into the beach, ram the beach and about a third of the passengers ran away from the British. Uh, Harry was captured by the British, had to be in a camp for a while. Then the British army hired him as a, um, as a projectionist. And then later he was a projectionist for uh, the Israeli army. And then later in 1956, he moved to Norwalk, Connecticut, and he ran a huge deli there with his wife and his son there. Uh, he was the Latkes King, I think. Uh, and um, uh, he died in 1998. But one of the purposes of my research here was uh, to get Harry a, an award. And the, uh, the only organization in the world that gives an award to Jews for saving other Jews is B'nai B'rith located in Israel, and I'm going to be there in, in a month, and I'll meet with them, and hopefully we'll be able to get Harry uh, a much-deserved award. 
because even his, his family didn't know what he pulled off here. And so I end with my, um, my family, uh, the three, I discovered a picture at our wedding, at Beth and my wedding, of the three sisters in the same order. And in the upper right hand, this, that was my mother at 102 years old. And that's, that's a lot of the family and my mother. That's, that picture's from about six years ago. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for going late. Um, we're going to take an opportunity if anybody has any questions for Bruce um, or our, our people online. Do you want to turn up the microphone? Yeah, sure. No, I'll, yeah, All I'll, right. I'll talk from here. Okay. Go ahead. He 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 said that the country didn't offer him enough, and uh, he he just wanted to come to the U.S. So it was I was already 1956 when he decided to leave Israel. Any other questions? Uh, none here. Okay. Initially, your family, they were going to leave from La Havre. That's where the ship was going to leave. And then fire, I understand. And then he said it was Lisbon. No, no, that, that was the trip of mom and Alice's youngest sister, Edith, and their mother. So what happened was Alice and uh, I don't know if the audience can hear the question. Yeah, I can hear Okay. So um, Alice and Ibby, my mother and older sister, aunt, uh, left in 1939, um, in but Edith and her mother went to join the older sister Shari in Budapest, and that's where they were going to stay. Right. And Alice from the U.S. said, "You need to get out too." Right. So the only port that was working after war started in Poland was Lisbon, and in fact, the ship that they went on was the same ship that I think uh, just a year earlier, Picasso paid for Salvador Dali to escape on. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that sh the, the sailing that they were on was one of the last sailings out of Lisbon before that port was closed. So Portugal was a neutral country. So that was why they were able to go there. And why I asked the question is that I'm, I'm doing a search also, but trying to find family who were in Budapest, but what ship they took when they emigrated to America. So, but, and that would be in the late 1800s. So oh, okay. That's why I'm well, I, mean, I will say one thing, Ancestry.com has locked up, unfortunately, I don't think it's fair, but they've locked up a lot of these ship manifests and won't let you see it until you pay them a monthly fee. But if you go on there and search under their names, you might be able to find them. You might be able to find them. So. Presumably one of the students asked, did your mother learn a new language or languages for her travels on her travels? Well, she obviously had to learn English. And one of the, one of the reasons that this was kind of difficult for me is my father spoke German. My, when he came to this country, my mother spoke Hungarian and maybe a little Czech. And uh, they both had to learn English when they got here. And I did ask the question of my father, you guys met within like two years after arriving in America. How did you guys connect if you didn't speak the same language? To which my father responded, you don't need language to fall in love. <laughs> Okay. Oh, and I have one more. Did your mother discover anything else significant during her travels? Uh, well, I can't ask her. I mean, I couldn't ask her when she had Alzheimer's, but um, I, I think she she fell in love with Paris, and that might be a reason why I love Paris so much, because, you know, it was her first taste of a truly free and modern city, and in fact, on the tapes, 
she said she spent eight days in Paris, which according to the documents, that's not true. So she had eight days worth of fun within just two nights. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. Any other questions? I think we're good here. I'll All right. Know in the next 10 seconds to talk. Okay. Thank you, Chris. All right, we're going to wrap up. Um, I'd like to invite all of you to come into the library. The exhibit is set up. You could be the exhibit there. Um, if there's no more questions, we could stop recording. And again, give Bruce another round of applause. Thank you, Bruce. Hard because of the accent. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and also the stores like the the yeah, all the stores. Yeah. Yeah. But well, this the is the vines that I follow. Yeah. 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 What an amazing story that was yeah. 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 to you about Harriet practicing with the Delhi King. Yeah. I'm sorry. I would love to. I know we're doing this with this. Hey, don't we get to meet Penelope? Yeah, you do. Yeah, the church is. Oh, I'll reach the gate at the library.
Yeah, too long. Yeah. So, three o'clock, five in the morning is long. I think they're excessively. I think they're Yeah. <laughs> 